narrow band, so we try to see if we can uh, increase their bandwidth at least in the transmission mode. And, uh, and then I will go through uh, reflectionless uh, refraction in light of these uh, bandwidth considerations. Then uh, using reflectionless uh, refraction, we will uh, study uh, bioanisotropic uh, lenses and combinations of those. And then this will lead to uh, these uh, non-local power conserving transformations. So again, uh, this is a very elementary introduction into these uh, Huygens uh, surfaces. We have an incident wavefront and we want to transform it to something desirable. And then this can be achieved by a surface which induces due to the incident wave, um, the right electric and magnetic currents, which typically are orthogonal to each other, to perform this transformation. Of course, the question is how you design such surfaces and also how you design them to remain uh, lossless and passive. Another way of uh, expressing the same problem is uh, through these uh, boundary conditions. So the, the discontinuity in the tangential magnetic field will give you the uh, J, the electric current density, and the discontinuity in the electric uh, field, the tangential electric field, will give rise to the required magnetic current. And then also this can be cast into these uh, boundary conditions where now we have to design to achieve, to excite the, the currents. You excite, uh, you, you make surfaces that have, are characterized by an impedance, spatial invariant impedance, superimposed to a spatial invariant admittance. And, and then you can achieve this uh, transformation that you need. Of course, there are other little details you need to ensure that this is a passive and lossless structure, and I will touch upon uh, this aspect a little bit later on. Now, the first thing, the first topic in this presentation, as I told you, is uh, to explore a little bit the bandwidth. So this is the generic uh, unit cell that was used uh, for, for making Huygens uh, surfaces. So you see it's a, an electric dipole uh, shown in blue, which is capacitively loaded. So this will give you the, the, the electric current J. And, and then there is this uh, loop that will give you the magnetic uh, current that you need. Also, in general, capacitively loaded. So this unit cell can be the basis of making uh, Huygens metasurfaces. Now, back in uh, 2013, we realized, actually with Michael Selvanayaka, that uh, the uh, field discontinuity equations that I showed you previously have a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, to the voltage current relationship uh, of this so-called lattice unit cell. It's a kind of surprising, actually. You get this uh, lattice unit cell to represent this uh, Huygens uh, source unit cell. And we know from uh, filter theory that you can make this all pass if you satisfy a certain condition. In this case, the condition is that the ratio between the impedance of the wire and the admittance of the loop is equal to the intrinsic wave impedance of the medium that surrounds the Huygens surface. So can we use this to achieve broadband transmission? And, you know, we, we tried to explore this question with Ayman Dora. So you see now a, a representation of the, of the unit cell. This is the, the dipole and this is the loop. And you see they are complementary to each other. So it's quite natural to achieve this balancing condition. 
And then you see that uh, when we tune properly the dimensions, we can get a broadband transmission between uh, two dielectric regions. In this example, having a relative permittivity of 20, and you see that we can get uh, like transmission. This is the transmission coefficient, this blue line, from 1 to 25 gigahertz. So, of course, this is not very useful. You know, it's like you go from one medium to another. It would be more useful if we have two different dielectric media and achieve some broadband matching. So this brings me to the uh, next topic, which is this bioanisotropic Huygens surfaces. And so now you allow one more degree of freedom. <clears throat> you allow the coupling between the electric and the magnetic currents through this uh, coupling coefficient k shown here. And then with this uh, additional degree of freedom, uh, we have shown in the past that you can get things like reflectionless refraction, and it will enable this kind of uh, matching that I just uh, mentioned as well. But the question is whether we can achieve these things with this wire loop topology. So I will tell you a little bit, uh, again, a little bit of uh, background about this bioanisotropic uh, uh, Huygens uh, surfaces. So here you see the non-bionisotropic -bionisot uh, version uh, of a unit cell that has been used also for making Huygens surfaces. Tony Griffith in the morning uh, showed this very well with the three layers. So we have these three dog bone uh, layers. And uh, how this uh, works is equivalent to the wire loop unit cell. So if you have a magnetic field H, it will induce a circulating current between the top and the bottom red uh, layers, these red uh, dog bones, and it will induce a magnetic dipole moment. Now the electric field will uh, in interact with the intermediate capacitive dipole and will give rise to an orthogonal uh, electric uh, current. Now how can we get by an isotropy? And what kind of by an isotropy I am talking about here. So you see there is this omega particle that naturally induces <laughs> orthogonal electric and magnetic uh, dipole moments which are capped. So <clears throat> this, is, this was well known, but we realized that actually you can achieve the same effect by just making your unit cell asymmetric. So now if you, you are top and bottom layers are not symmetric, the magnetic field will induce both an electric and magnetic dipole moment, but also because of the asymmetry, <laughs> some electric dipole moment as well. Likewise, for the electric field will induce this uh, orthogonal electric and magnetic <laughs> dipole moments. So this is uh, this so-called omega bionisotropy. So when I say by an isotropic, I mean this omega by an isotropy. But the key point here is that you break the symmetry and then you achieve this omega by an isotropy. So can we at, uh, achieve the same effect with the wire loop unit cell? And the answer is yes. Obviously, you just need to offset the loop with respect to the dipole. And then uh, you can get a by an isotropic unit cell. And the Corresponding lattice unit cell can be modified now with a, an, a, an ideal transformer having this uh, K uh, the coupling ratio as the tense ratio. And then we couple, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the loop and the dipole in this circuit. Now, we have worked out with uh, Eyman the new balancing condition, and now the ratio of Z to Y should be equal to the product of the two wave impedances. Now we have two different regions. And uh, when we, we do that, we can actually get a broadband matching between two dielectric uh, media. For example, here, epsilon R, uh, 135 to 10. And we get a good uh, transmission from 1 to 21 gigahertz.
So very broadband matching, if you like. It's a method of broadband matching. So of course this is for normal incidents. Now in the past, as I said, we have looked at uh, reflectionless refraction with these bionisotropic uh, unit cells. And uh, this is an example here where we go from normal incidence to, I, I believe, 72 degrees. And uh, uh, we did this experiment uh, with these uh, uh, asymmetric uh, top bone unit cells. So this is the surface. We have a, this is at 20 gigahertz, so it's a quasi-optical millimeter wave setup. So you shine the surface with a normal incident Gaussian beam, and you look at the reflect, uh, reflections. So this is the reflections. You see at the right frequency, there is minimum uh, reflections. Now what happens uh, to the transmitted uh, spectrum? And uh, you see, this is uh, uh, nice that I would like to like advertise this Huygens surfaces. You see, this is the right uh, transmitted uh, Floquet mode, the plus one, one uh, the plus one uh, Floquet mode, and it corresponds to 71.8 uh, degrees. And these are the other possible excited uh, uh, Floquet modes uh, allowed by the grating equation. And you see, when you are at the wrong frequency, the red one, you, you excite them. But when you hit this uh, nice frequency where the conditions of the uh, bioanisotropy are met, uh, you see the, with blue, all these higher order Floquet modes, the reflections, the uh, transmission to uh, minus 71, 0.8 degrees and so on are suppressed. So uh, you can control very precisely your uh, Floquet modes with these Huygens surfaces. Now Michael Chen uh, designed uh, one of these uh, Huygens reflectionless uh, surfaces but using this new unit cell. So you see the wire loop one now. So we have 10 uh, cells per period, again at the same frequency, and he got very nice uh, full wave simulation results. You know, not much reflection here. And you see that uh, you have good transmission and suppression of the, uh, of the other Floquet modes. And maybe what is interesting is to compare this design with the one with the three top bones. And you see, you can get quite uh, much more bandwidth compared to the top bone structure. And mind you that this was not really optimized to satisfy it in all unit cells, this balancing condition. So I believe there is much more uh, room for improvement here. Okay, now we have this you know, by an isotropic uh, reflectionless refraction, what can you do with that? So you can make lenses and combination of lenses. And this was something that we started over a year ago with Gleb, Gleb Begorov. We had an industrial project that they asked us to increase the directivity of a moder moderating directive antenna ray. So we thought of using lenses for this, and we tried to sell this aspect that these lenses are reflectionless. So we set uh, to make uh, lenses, and uh, here we made a diverging uh, lens, and I will tell you why. And uh, so we used uh, the fields of, uh, this is uh, for two dimensions, so these are the fields from a line source here represented by these Heinkel functions. And then on the other side, ideally for a lens, you want a plane wave, right? But this is where a subtle point comes, you know. I think that Tony and Ariel before explained that in order to ensure that these surfaces are uh, 
lossless and passive, you need to make sure that the local normal power is conserved, which means you cannot have really a plane wave here because uh, you will conserve the local power. Uh, so, but you, you will have a modulated uh, plane wave and you know what it is because you know it's a flat phase and you know the amplitude, it has to match the amplitude of the cylindrical wave. So GLEB designed such a lens and okay, and we have a design project process that uh, was developed when uh, Ariel uh, Epstein was with us to uh, design these surfaces. And uh, this is the, uh, the result. So you see, uh, this lens works uh, quite well. This is a simulation and console uh, showing a white, uh, a Gaussian beam with a white uh, waist, and it, it's converted into a diverging one. And, and now, uh, I told you that we had this application that we wanted to increase the directivity of a, of a certain moderately directive uh, antenna array. And the solution that we proposed was actually to use a beam expander as shown here. So uh, this beam expander is kind of like an inverted uh, Galilean telescope. And you can place your uh, aperture here and increase <laughs> the illumination of the second surface. And for this, you need a, a, a diverging and a converging lens. That's why we had, I showed you earlier, a, a diverging lens. And this works quite well. You see, we have, a, again, a Gaussian beam that is expanded very well. And yeah, if you put a, an antenna array here, you can increase the directivity quite a bit. Now, this uh, project uh, uh, prompted us to uh, go back and look at this uh, difficulty that we had before. I told you that we couldn't design a, a lens that will match here a plane wave because the power should be locally conserved. But when you look at this diagram here, you understand that th there is a solution to uh, a local power conservation because, you know, you take these uh, uh, fields, you expand them, and now this transformation from the input to the output to Gaussian beams, uh, if you go vertically, the power is not locally conserved. So I guess we, uh, I had Eamon Dora actually look into this problem. And now you will, uh, there is some connection with what uh, Tony Gripik uh, showed uh, earlier in the morning. So, but our motivation at the time was, you know, I have now, I want to make a, a, a transformation between a cylindrical wave and a plane wave. So, uh, so this, uh, the power is not locally conserved. So how can we do that? Well, we can take this beam expander solution and generalize it a little bit. So you can have now these two bionisotropic uh, surfaces and allow uh, a, a, a spectrum of plane waves in between them. And then you can find the amplitudes of each uh, plane wave that will enable this transformation between an incident wave and a transmitted wave, in this case a cylindrical wave and a truncated plane wave. Now we did similar things in the past with Ariel, but there we had uh, uh, the cavity and all these modes uh, were, were cavity modes and there was only a single surface on top and we could use this for antenna beam form. But here we wanted to do this lens transformation, so this uh, makes more, more sense. So Iman, uh, look at this problem. We have uh, the expansion in terms of plane waves here. I think he found the power in terms of these plane waves, and we allowed all the incident reflected and even evanescent waves. 
And then uh, he used uh, least square optimization to actually uh, uh, up, um, I, I design these surfaces. You know, I don't have time to go through all of this, but this is uh, one uh, <coughs> result that we got. So we have the incident uh, cylindrical wave. The, the, the solid is the, is the incident field. The solid uh, line, uh, this blue line, the solid uh, yellow line is the desired output field, which in this case should be a, a constant, we want a plane wave. And the dotted lines is through the optimization trying to approximate these uh, power profiles. And you see you can approximate it quite well with this dotted line here. So M2 is the, is the power profile after the second uh, by an isotropic surface. And this is the corresponding uh, spectrum that uh, is needed here, uh, sorry, the weights of the plane waves. We only had to use uh, propagating plane waves here, that's what came out of this optimization. And I believe the reason is because the distance between the two surfaces is, is moderate, it's 1.5 wavelengths. I guess if you keep bringing the surfaces closer and closer together, you will need reflections and even maybe evanescent waves. So, this is a, a result that uh, I'm on board. This is the source very close to the first uh, surface and how it's transformed to a truncated uh, plane wave. Uh, this was a full wave console simulation. And I guess this relates to what uh, Tony Griffith showed earlier. In fact, uh, we cite here a paper from his group that he presented uh, some of this uh, last uh, month at, AP, uh, at the AP conference. And we have a paper that is already uh, on IEEE Explore to be published in IEEE antennas and wireless propagation letters. So I guess I am, uh, I am done. So <laughs> uh, this is a summary of uh, what I showed you, uh, I guess. Uh, we talk about the bandwidth aspects one aspect, you know, the transmission of uh, this uh, normal Huygens and bi-isotropic Huygens surfaces. And we showed that you can get really more bandwidth, at least in transmission, for applications <laughs> such as reflection, less refra refraction. Then I discussed bi isotropic uh, uh, lenses and combinations of those. And I uh, finished with uh, these non-local power conserving transformations. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'd uh, be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Just a very quick clarification. Yeah. I've never quite understood uh, what you refer to uh, by a uh, Huygens metal surface. What would be a metal surface that is not that is not Huygens? What, what do you really mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Huygens had a uh, this uh, treatise on light that he tried to explain how refraction and uh, even reflection that can be explained in terms of wavelets uh, that uh, emanate uh, cylindrical waves. So in terms of uh, secondary sources actually, so you can think of these surfaces that they excite the secondary force, uh, sources. You know, we have an electric dipole and a magnetic dipole and this is a secondary scatterer that uh, synthesizes the wavefronts that you desire. Sure, so, so it's a matter of perspective, not of essence. Yeah, it's, yeah okay. if you, if you, you okay. know, Huygens never used that, what we know now as a Huygens source, right? That uh, he didn't describe how the waves yeah. don't go backwards. Yeah. 
But of course, this wire loop uh, unit cell in transmission, that's what it does. The waves primarily. The reason I'm asking is, is any problem can be modeled by the Huygens theorem in terms of the equivalent sources. So I was wondering whether you had something more or that's no, why. Yeah, you can also okay. think of it as the, I mean, the equivalence principle sort of more mathematically uh, nail this concept down because you need the both electric and magnetic currents to make the waves travel unidirectionally. Yes. Other questions? No? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. The multi scale modeling of electrically large well gap fed with metal surface aperture using a cup of battle approach. And uh, the paper will be presented by Dave Smith. Yeah, okay. Great. Yeah, this microphone is a little disconcerting. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some things and uh, some updates that we have in, in uh, uh, modeling uh, some of the structures uh, that we're interested in. Uh, a lot of this work, I'll just get these, this up front, uh, was done by Laura Polito and, and Patrick Bowen in my group, and also Nathan Kuntz, who's now CEO of Chimeta, and sponsored by Air Force Office of Scientific Research. So uh, motivation is that uh, we've, for the past number of years, we've been, we've been working on commercialization of a lot of the concepts of uh, metasurfaces. And in particular, our type that I'll be talking about is uh, um, uh, waveguide-fed metasurface. And Jen and I'll talk about what that is. And that's led to the spin-off of these various companies, Pimeta, Echodyne, Holosense, Evolve, uh, Pivotal, uh, all using sort of a commonality of, a, of an aperture uh, that's formed using a, a, the type of metasurface I'll be talking about. The reason that they've turned into different companies is that uh, it actually makes sense because all these uh, are in different application areas. All the other supportive technologies that go into each of these are very different. So it actually makes sense to uh, take them apart and, and have them address their individual markets in different companies. But uh, there's certainly a commonality on the aperture, uh, and we are constantly thinking about how to model that better and, and uh, 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 what more types of functionality we can bring in and how to make that more apparent from a design point of view. So there's more to come, uh, but uh, just a couple of pictures. Uh, since Chimeta is now shipping products, you can actually see these Chimeta antennas uh, uh, beginning to show up uh, in maritime and in other uh, application areas. Uh, these are fairly large apertures, so they tend to be 40 wavelengths or so. These are for uh, satellite communications. Um, the, the, uh, they're replacing actually even larger structures, but they're still very large. And uh, if one were to try to simulate uh, this using uh, for example, finite element or finite difference, it would take a very long time if you could even do it. Um, so uh, certainly one would like to be able to simulate these more efficiently. And also, uh, I'm going to show this because now Echodyne has started shipping products. Uh, there's uh, a few different types, Echo Flight, Echo Guard, Echo Drive. Um, and they were nice enough, Tom Driscoll was nice enough to send uh, a unit out. Uh, so that I guess there'll be a display later on of, of samples. And so you can see uh, one of these packaged units and then also a little bit about what's inside of it is, uh, is going to be one of the exhibitions. So uh, these are coming out and that's an inspiration for what I'm going to be talking about is, is what these actually are and then ways of, of uh, looking at them that makes it efficient to, in terms of a design process. So starting from the basics, uh, you can imagine if you have something like a waveguide, there's many types of waveguides, you've got parallel plate waveguides, uh, rectangular waveguides or something like a microstrip, uh, you know if you uh, feed this on one end, you will create a wave that goes down uh, and is confined uh, to within the region between the two conductors uh, from a feed to a termination. 
Uh, so the anatomy is you have a waveguide, which is just a substrate here, a ground plane, and then you have the upper conductor. If you now uh, put something in that upper conductor, uh, like an iris, or in this case, a CELC, uh, complementary metamaterial element, uh, that's a discontinuity, uh, which will certainly create a, uh, some sort of uh, impedance mismatch, so you'll get a reflected wave and a transmitted wave, but also this will leak energy out, so it radiates. So this is the basis of how you might make an antenna. Um, what is nice is if uh, you can describe that as simply as possible, and because we're thinking of metasurfaces, each element being much, much smaller than the wavelength, uh, the idea is that you could replace that uh, in all of its detail just with a, uh, a polarizable point dipole. So uh, if, in fact, that's true, then you have a, a dipole that gets created uh, that is some polarizability times uh, your incident magnetic field. I use magnetic uh, because you want this thing to radiate. If you had an electric dipole here, which you could do, it wouldn't radiate that well. Uh, so really, you'd like these to be dominated by magnetic uh, dipoles. And uh, so in the end, it's just some magnitude and phase uh, of this polarizability times your feed wave. And this radiates, and if that's true, you know how a dipole radiates. It's a very simple uh, uh, expression and uh, your de design or characterization of the structure become very simple. So uh, we know how it radiates, dipole radiation is simple to calculate, uh, and so if, uh, uh, it, it's also uh, maybe less simple, but certainly a uh, straightforward thing to do to figure out how a dipole will radiate back into the waveguide, because you have to figure that out too. Uh, all of those things are important, so if you have a wave coming in, uh, that's incident on this region here where this discontinuity is, this is just showing some, some plane in there, it's not real, uh, it will scatter, not only will it radiate, but it'll scatter inside, and so your model would have to take into account, uh, if you want to have a, a proper solution, not only this radiation component from this magnetic dipole, but also the impact back on the waveguide for a complete solution. So that's a, the basic equivalent dipole description, and it's uh, a good thing to do, provided that uh, this element can, in fact, be described as a dipole, which uh, what I'll show is that that typically is the case, at least for the structures that we've been developing. So as a first step, uh, one needs to get uh, what that uh, polarizability is. So you can do it by analytical methods, but uh, it's actually, if you want to have some uh, uh, ubiquity and not have to worry about all the details that might emerge in the actual design, actual fabricated structure, it's nice to have a numerical procedure of at least getting the polarizability of this element. And that can be done by a couple of different ways. Uh, one is by using surface equivalence principles, which you've heard a number of uh, times throughout the talks today, uh, where you can uh, use the field's incident uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this iris area as effective sources. And so if we have a magnetic current, an electric current, uh, then it's a relatively straightforward set of integrals to take you to electric dipole moments and magnetic dipole moments. Um, so your K uh, or E, uh, for example, is, is related to H, so you're, uh, if you work it through, the magnetic field ends up being just this integral here, and you can express that as being uh, some polarizability tensor in general. Uh, times your incident feed, uh, which is your incident H field. And likewise for if there is any electric uh, dipole moment. That's one method. Another method is to use coupled mode theory, which you can do very well uh, for the waveguide geometry, at least the linear waveguide geometry, which says that uh, you can relate uh, this uh, dipole moment uh, to the way in which it will scatter into the set of uh, waveguide modes. And since really we don't care about all the evanescent modes that will die away, uh, we care mainly about the, uh, uh, the, the, the lowest order propagating mode in this uh, structure, we can end up relating the polarizability to the transmitted and reflected waves. So you can run a simulation, uh, you can do an S-parameters retrieval, or you can do a direct integration. And this is, in fact, reminiscent of what we used to do uh, to do homogenization. These were a couple of methods to find the equivalent epsilon and mu of a material. Here we're using it to find uh, something that's a little bit more palatable, uh, the, the actual uh, polarizability. So it's a discrete model, 
but it's a very physics-based model. So we can find the polarizabilities of these elements using one of these two methods. And it works very well. Uh, these are comparisons here between uh, uh, coupled mode theory, equivalence principle. Uh, in, in certain simple irises, you have uh, analytic results from beta, uh, and uh, those can be compared as well, and you can see that you get very, very good agreement in all these cases. Uh, these are non-resonant. Uh, what we like about the meta-elements, or sometimes things with, uh, uh, that are a little bit more complicated, like an iris bed patch, uh, you get uh, a resonance, and even there, you can't, you don't have the analytic results anymore, but uh, you can compare with Foley simulations, and you can see that you get very good agreement in, in all these cases. So uh, you have an approach now, and it's not a very large domain that you have to simulate, whereby you can get the effective dipole moment of your iris or your meta material element or whatever you have uh, using one of these methods. So that's sort of a step one of, of working towards a multi-scale uh, modeling method. So having found this, uh, we find the polarizability. It's an easy step uh, to go forward and say, now I want uh, to create an antenna out of this. And instead of having all these uh, uh, pieces that I have to deal with, I now learn that I can just replace these by dipoles. And once again, that's a very, very simple thing to work with uh, and, and work into a, a larger scale uh, uh, modeling approach. So, to take a step and just talk about uh, uh, what the, this antenna is and how it works, uh, like I said, you have a feed wave, which is where you're, you're bringing this phase in. It propagates along here and feeds all these dipole elements each of which radiates. Uh, for this moment, I won't worry about radiation back into the waveguide, I'll just worry about how they radiate outwards. Uh, each one of these has a uh, far field uh, radiation, each uh, dipole has this radiation. It's just found by writing down the, the expression for a dipole. Um, each uh, dipole has a moment that's given by its polarizability. And if you put all this together, you end up with the radiation from each element. And then you can take this and sum it over all of the dipoles in your antenna. Uh, and if we just worry about the angular dependence, we get an expression like this, which is the equivalent of an array factor, except for a metasurface or a waveguide-fed metasurface antenna. And that's uh, what we have here. Um, I can't go through all the design details of, of how you choose these weights, uh, but in the end, we want to choose these polarizabilities to get whatever output wave that we want to have. And we have a whole set of design procedures uh, for doing this and, and holographic approaches. For now, I'll just keep it simple and say uh, we can just choose the polarizabilities to get uh, certain things that we want. So for an example, oh, what I should say, or what's very important uh, for the metasurface antennas that I'll be talking about is the fact that these polarizabilities are constrained by physics. So they're constrained by real world physics, which means that each has a, a Lorentzian type resonance, and that resonance uh, ties together the phase and the amplitude uh, of, of the resonator. So you don't have arbitrary phase and amplitude control in this particular structure. Uh, you have, if you just have one resonator, uh, something that uh, is, is related to this equation here, uh, which can be re expressed so, so that you can see that the uh, amplitude is related to the cosine of the, of, of the phase. So you, that's an expression of this resonance curve here, where the phase varies as a function of the, of the amplitude, uh, or vice versa, and you um, don't have freedom to, to just get anything. So if you're unconstrained, uh, if you were to plot this polarizability in real imaginary, uh, you could have any phase that you wanted, which is uh, represented by going around the circle, and any amplitude you wanted, uh, and in a real, say, phased array, this would be done by using phase shifters and, and amplifiers. Uh, for us, we're constrained to sit on the circle here, and I'll just give an apology. I switched my convention here. I'm using I instead of J just for this slide because I like it better. Um, but anyway, so normally if I was using J, this would be in the lower half plane. It, it doesn't really change things, uh, but I just happen to like it better. Uh, so up here, this is, uh, we are constrained, so the amplitude and the phase end up giving you a circle like that. If you have a, a design where you have to get phases, for example, uh, that are in t in s along this entire loop, uh, you have to have some rational way, uh, if you have no other uh, active elements, 
to map these phases uh, to what you have available. And if you do this in a, in a rational way, it turns out that you can su suppress all the things you might worry about, like uh, uh, higher order modes, uh, grading lobes, all those sorts of things, uh, by just how you do this mapping here. And that's part of what we, one of the things that we've been working on. So, does it work? It works pretty well. Um, you can take uh, a, uh, as a part of a design process, um, like I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, what you might like, for example, is a, a directed beam going in some direction, which means you have a KX and a KZ uh, away from your aperture. In the, in the aperture plane, uh, you would like your ideal field to just be this, e to the minus j kx x, and uh, at, at some direct direction, phi zero. And uh, if you put that in, it implies uh, that your ideal amplitudes are going to be given by this. Um, and again, there's a lot of ways to see that. You can put that into, the, uh, uh, into this uh, array factor equation and you'll see kind of a delta-like function of behavior at the angle that you're looking for. So uh, this is ideal, but again, that would require phase shifters. This requires a full 360-degree phase shift and, and amplitude control, not for uh, directed view, uh, but in general. And uh, you can take then, uh, turns out the Lorentzian constraint, uh, where I do that mapping, leads to a fairly simple expression, which I can write here, so this is allowed. Um, you can also look at other things like grayscale, where you would just take the real part uh, in some way like that, or you can look at binary, uh, where you actually put a, a heavy side step function and uh, uh, just, just require it to either be one or another value. Uh, so all these things are possible, and all these things you can actually uh, put into this array factory and see amplitude only, binary. Uh, it doesn't work as well as amplitude only grayscale, where you're actually giving yourself some some region of, of, uh, uh, of, of amplitude. And then if you actually have this Lorentzian constrained uh, version, you get almost perfect performance. So this is now assuming no interactions, but just, uh, which is in some cases actually good enough to, to predict the performance of these structures. Um, and this is how the, the, uh, the basics of how a structure like this would work. Now, if you want to turn on the interactions, uh, it's, as I said, it's fairly straightforward to do it. Uh, you imagine uh, that you have a bunch of dipoles and they're all interacting now. Uh, so the MI uh, dipole interacts with the MJ dipole. Um, and you can write down just these expressions as this laser pointer begins to fade. Um, so each uh, dipole at position RI is equal to a polarizability tensor times the local field. The local field is equal to the incident field plus the scattered field. And the scatter field at the position Ri consists of the field from all the other dipoles located at the uh, uh, position Ri. So we write this as a Green's function. So we can write this equation here, and then substituting back in this first equation, uh, we end up with a matrix equation, which now takes into account all the interactions between all these dipoles. And again, you can easily write down the Green's function for free space, it looks like that. And so this accounts for all the interactions between all the dipoles and is now just a matrix equation given by the, uh, uh, the dimension of the number of, of dipoles that you have, which is not too hard to, to solve uh, in this framework. We can uh, actually have methods of accelerating it. You can take another step. Obviously, you have to worry about the free space interactions, but you also have to worry about the interactions from the waveguide. And there, it requires you to add another term and this other term now uh, might look something like this. And this is overcomplicated because, we, again, we really don't need all the higher order modes that uh, don't propagate from one point to the other. We just need the, uh, the lowest order one, and that means usually one term of this. So we can account both for interactions through the waveguide and uh, through free space. And now this gives us a complete description of, of an antenna structure. And uh, this was done. Uh, in this case, we did it for a leaky waveguide. This is work that Laura did early on to show uh, the, how well it uh, could work. And you can see uh, some comparisons here. Uh, and I won't go through in detail on the comparisons, but you can see that uh, uh, CST simulations, full wave simulations agreed with this uh, coupled dipole approach. And so it really does give a very accurate uh, characterization 
Um, it works for full-length simulation, but the fact that you can do it with this coupled dipole means you can do much, much larger structures, and it's useful for really most waveguide type geometries. Just another example, uh, 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 larger structures, uh, different types of viruses, um, all of these can be uh, uh, simulated. And at some point, you begin, uh, the agreement is so good that we really don't know which one's off, whether it's CST, which is not always dead on, or HFSS, which sometimes these programs disagree with each other, uh, but we're sort of in the noise in, in terms of that level of modeling. Now, uh, we're interested in more complicated structures, and one of the things that we're interested in modeling, for example, is this uh, uh, dynamic structure. So when I showed the first slide of the, the companies, these are all dynamic uh, antennas, and so the uh, geometry is more complicated. I'm showing you something that was done in our lab. Uh, when you want to add dynamic reconfigurability, you have to put something there that will change the properties dynamically. In this case, we're using uh, uh, diodes, so we're actually switching uh, between a couple of values. And once you put in those diodes or those active elements, you need to actually create uh, uh, bias circuits. So in this case, we've got vias that go from uh, the center of this ELC, for example, CELC, uh, down to some uh, bias circuit in the bottom and it becomes a, a multi-layer uh, circuit board process and there's just more components involved. Um, so your design has to uh, provide isolation, for example, between bias and RF lines, which is why you see this uh, interesting design down there, and this layer, which is a choke, uh, for, uh, so the RF doesn't couple to the bias line. Anyway, all this uh, ultimately needs to be taken care of in, in a, uh, a more uh, extensive analysis. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple slides to show uh, an example of this. Uh, this is something we've done in our lab. It's a very poor, uh, it's, it's definitely not a commercial level thing, but it's a, it's a bunch of uh, uh, elements like this. Uh, they're dynamic. Uh, each one has a, a set of diodes that can be turned on and off. These resonances uh, can either be on or off. It happens to have two frequencies. This was used for imaging, so we weren't really trying to design the modes in this case. Uh, but it's the kind of structure that we'd like to be able to uh, uh, simulate eventually. So this is showing uh, uh, just how this would work. Um, since we uh, couldn't do the, at the time, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the couple of dipole approach to model this, what we've done is actually measure the structure and uh, we, we map the fields in uh, a plane using a near-field scanner and then from that we can uh, uh, we can back propagate to the aperture plane, which you're seeing here, and these are effective dipoles. You see them lighting up. And once we extract these effective dipoles from uh, uh, the data, then we can propagate them forward and know the fields everywhere, which we use for some of our imaging experiments. And while this wasn't uh, designed for, for beam steering, in fact, we can find conditions where we, we can uh, create uh, uh, a very clear angle versus uh, uh, set of voltages. Um, so, and you can get essentially steering across some, some reasonably uh, large angular region. So uh, this is showing uh, that same data, but now we've selected the ones that actually give us steering, uh, just to show that we can do uh, types of uh, imaging uh, scenarios that we were interested in. Uh, some of these have to be with synthetic aperture, uh, 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 types of imaging, and so there's a few different modes, uh, for example, strip light, spotlight, and, and other types. And uh, this is just showing that you can actually take these and, and do imaging. These are just some results from our lab uh, where we've taken that aperture. Uh, we are required uh, for to, to actually do a reconstruction like this to know uh, what those fields are in detail, so we have to understand what the dipoles are and propagate them. So, uh, I just wanted to, to pause for a moment and talk about the differences in, in architectures. Um, we're talking about this metasurface antenna here, which is, which is really a passive architecture. So we're changing, you know, you, have, you may ask why you're doing this. Uh, we can change and tune these, uh, but it's a passive tuning as opposed to something like a phase array, uh, which would have phase shifters at each radiating node, 
and uh, each of these phase shifters has to be externally powered. So that's a that's a uh, an active uh, type of uh, array structure. Even worse, if you look at an electronically scanned antenna, which would have not only phase shifters but also amplifiers uh, at each radiating node. Um, another type, which is a little bit uh, more passive, might be a switched array antenna or a minor array, uh, which could be done, but then requires you to have a lot of switchers, switches or a switch network. All of these are possible, but they're a lot more expensive and they consume more power uh, compared to this structure here, which is why this has been an advantageous structure, especially for dynamic steering and things like that. Um, sometimes uh, I get the comment that this is just a phased array. Um, in, in, for people that make these things, phased array has a very specific meaning. It, it means something like this architecture here. Uh, so this is, it turns out, a fairly new, uh, or, a new approach uh, in terms of commercialization uh, that gives uh, a much lower cost dynamically steerable antenna and it turns out with about as good performance as, as some of these other types of uh, more well-established uh, structures. So uh, one last type of antenna that we've been working with uh, for uh, a project that we've done for uh, imaging people for, for security applications is this cavity-backed uh, metasurface antenna. And here it's a little different because it's not just a waveguide, uh, but in fact it's a cavity, and in this particular version, uh, we've created a cavity in, in circuit board using vias, so we have something that confines our radiation, and then we've got some apertures through which the, uh, the wave leaks out. And this turns out to give us a much better performance, allows us better aperture efficiency, we can fill the aperture because it's a cavity, and uh, uh, for a lot of the applications we're looking at, this just turns out to be very advantageous. So we would like to be able to model this, uh, and uh, uh, now that uh, requires us to go into a two-dimensional geometry. So I'm going to very quickly do the same thing. Uh, this is a parallel plate waveguide now, uh, and you can do the exact same sort of retrieval. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, we end up with expressions like this uh, for the coefficients of the um, polarizability. And if we use uh, what we get from this extraction, again, we get very good agreement uh, with, with Foley simulation and, and uh, other types. This is uh, the coupled dipole predicting uh, what this element will scatter like at uh, different frequencies, and this is the Foley simulation. You can see they're, they're virtually identical. So uh, if you start making it more complicated, if you put a bunch of these into a parallel plate waveguide and look at uh, at least the field inside, you can see that uh, if you don't include the interaction, the, the Green's function inside the waveguide, uh, it's a little worse agreement uh, for this sparse array than it is if you include the coupled dipoles. And these are two different designs and you see the same thing. So uh, uh, you can look at uh, this now, uh, actually is kind of instructive. You can see if there's no interactions, uh, this is now the error uh, between the CST simulation and the coupled dipole. And so you get quite a bit of error if you ex exclude all the interactions. If you include the waveguide interactions, you get very little error. If you include just the free space interactions, in this Green's function here, you actually get uh, uh, quite a bit of error, and it means that the, uh, uh, the dominant interaction is actually inside the waveguide. So if you include all interactions, you can see you get perfect agreement again. And the far field uh, agrees between the, the two uh, for this uh, uh, multi-slot aperture. And finally, we are really interested in also in these uh, uh, vias, and those vias can also be put into the uh, dipole approach. Uh, and, and uh, treat it as dipoles. So we can treat all these vias, including the via cage and anything inside, as electric dipole elements, and that's what's uh, been done here. I shouldn't say electric dipole, but I'll say it anyway for now. Uh, ultimately, you can work it into something that looks like a very similar Green's function. And you can see these comparisons now uh, at different frequencies uh, for the waves bouncing around now inside this environment with all these vias. Again, these field patterns are identical. Um, which is which is nice, uh, and again, this uh, uh, dipole approach will scale quite nicely. So uh, I'll stop there. This is an example. Uh, again, won't go through the details, but this is a much larger antenna, and it shows that uh, uh, 
right here, that again, the, the, in this case with HFSS and the coupled dipole model, you really get uh, excellent agreement um, and uh, can predict all these types of patterns now in seconds uh, using this, this uh, formalism. So uh, I'll stop here and just say that it's uh, uh, an interesting approach. It's sort of a physics-based approach. It's not what engineers typically do, uh, but it's a language uh, that has proved useful for us. And uh, hopefully, well, we'll see more of this uh, as we go forward. So I'll stop there. Question from the audience. Please. Thank you, Thank you. Actually, it was a very nice uh, uh, overview talk. So, uh, just a qu quick question: What's the distance typically between two uh, CLCs? Is it half wavelength? Uh, it depends on the design, but it's it's uh, anywhere from lambda over ten to maybe lambda over three or lambda over two. Okay. The, the actual question that I have is that if, if the spacing is very small, won't you need many diodes per wavelength? Many what? Diodes. Diodes. Yeah. Yes, we would. Okay. So. Um. <laughs> but it's still simple.